start by giving a brief introduction to some uh, common uh, simple models of distributed computing. Then I'll present a number of impossibility results for different problems and different distributed models to illustrate different proof techniques. So a distributed system is a collection of processes that can communicate by sending and receiving messages amongst one another or by performing operations on shared objects. In the first case, um, we say that we have a message passing system or model, and in the second case we say that we have a shared memory model. Um, executions can be either finite or infinite, and an infinite execution can describe the correct operation of an algorithm such as an operating system that isn't supposed to stop, or it can describe a situation in which an algorithm doesn't terminate because it's incorrect. In addition, a model can be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, in synchronous systems, uh, processes take steps at the same rate. In such models, um, an execution is divided into rounds, and in each round, each process takes one step, in which it receives messages from other processes, does local computation, and sends a message to, to other processes. And the messages sent in one round um, are received in the next round. Now, synchronous models can differ in the number of messages a process can send each round, and whether all the messages a process sends in the round must be the same, so whether it's broadcast or point-to-point um, -point communication. A configuration describes the system between consecutive rounds. It consists of the state of every process at the end of the preceding round and the messages that are in transit. Um, um, okay, it, it also, um, basically, what we, for each edge of the network, we have to know which messages were sent along the edge of the network during the preceding round and which will be received um, during the following round. Um, an initial configuration describes the um, system at the beginning of an execution, and each process is in an initial state, which includes its input, and there are no messages in transit. Okay, so that's, that's what we have for a, um, a synchronous message passing system. Now, we also have asynchronous message passing systems, and their processes take steps in an arbitrary order, and from a theoretical point of view, this is determined by an adversarial scheduler. Um, and an execution here is a sequence of steps. Um, in each step, either one message is delivered or one process receives messages that have been delivered to it from other processes, does local computation, and sends messages to other processes. Um, messages can take arbitrarily long to be delivered. Um, uh, these models can differ in the number of messages that a process can send in any round, uh, sorry, send in any step, or um, the number it receives in any step. Um, and again, when it's sending multiple messages at one step, whether they all have to be the same or they can be different. In this model, a configuration describes the system between concept, concept, eh, describes the, the system between consecutive steps of an execution again. Um, but it consists of the state of every process, the messages that each process has sent but have not yet been delivered, and the messages that have been delivered to each process, which is not yet received. So we can sort of think of this link, uh, between uh, this edge between these two processes. Things get sent, they get put on the edge, then they're delivered, and then they're received at, a, at another step. Um, an initial configuration describes a system at the beginning of an execution. Um, each process is an initial state, which includes its input, and there are no messages in transit. Uh, the other model we want to consider is asynchronous shared memory. We want to consider asynchronous shared memory models. Um, again, processes take steps in an arbitrary order determined by an ad adversarial scheduler, and an execution is just a sequence of steps. So these are very similar, but the communication is different. In each step, one process performs an operation on a shared object and does local computation. Um, so in particular here, we have a process that may be writing to this object and reading from that object. Okay, each object has a type which specifies the set of possible values it can have, um, its initial value, and the set of uh, operations that can be applied to it. When a process performs an operation on an object, it gets back a response. The process um, updates its state depending on the current state and the response from the object. The operation might, might also change the value of the object, and all of these things occur atomically. This means the two operations don't overlap. One example of an object is a register. 
Um, the set of possible values uh, can be arbitrary, but in general, we think about the integers <coughs> or the uh, natural numbers with initial value zero. Um, read returns the value of the register, uh, but doesn't change the, its value. And write sets the value of um, the register um, to the input value, to the parameter v. Um, a write always just returns um, the ACK, an acknowledgment. Another example of an object is a compare and swap object. Here we have um, uh, one additional value in our set, which is a bottom, which is the initial value. And this uh, object supports one operation, which is called CAS. Um, and it takes two parameters in addition to the, the name of the object, u and v. And essentially what it does is it compares the value of the, um, the object r. And if it is equal to u, the, the value of the second uh, parameter, it changes the value of, of r to, from u to v. Otherwise, it leaves the value of, um, of r unchanged. In any case, it always returns uh, the value of the object. U and V are not supposed to be bottom. These are values. So the U and V are possible values. And you typically, um, U and uh, V is not going to be bottom. But um, you can. yeah, certainly you can. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to change the state of it at all. Okay. Now, throughout this talk, I am not going to talk about I'm the only um, when I'm talking about shared memory. I'm only going to um, consider uh, registers just to make things simple. But I just want you to know that there's lots and lots of different types of objects, and there's a huge part of theory of distributed computing that looks at um, understanding the relationships between those. So, in a shared memory system, a configuration describes the system between consecutive steps of an execution. It consists of the state of every process and the value of every shared object. And again, initial configuration describes the system at the beginning of an execution. Each process is in its initial state, which includes its input. And each shared object has a predetermined initial value. A distributed system may also experience faults. Okay, The simplest is a crash fault in which a process simply stops taking steps before it finishes its task. So when a process is done and doesn't do anything else, we don't say it's crashed. But if it's in the middle of doing something and doesn't take any more steps, i.e. the adversarial scheduler stops scheduling it to take steps, we say that the process is crashed. Um, there are a whole bunch of other kinds of faults that um, are considered things like the worst of Byzantine faults, where a faulty process can arbitrarily deviate from its, its protocol. Um, there are things where um, there's just faults in the communication system, where messages are lost or duplicated, reordered. Um, shared objects can, um, not, can return the wrong value or can um, not receive the value that's written. That's, um, that somehow um, misapplied, the operation that's applied to them can be wrong. And we're not going to include, uh, consider any of them. When I, sometimes I'll consider models where there are no faults, and other times I'll consider there will be models um, where there are crash failures. But I, for the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to restrict our attention to that. OK, now there's not a sharp boundary between distributed and parallel computing. Okay. The essential difference really is the types of problems that are considered. In distributed computing, each process may have its own task to do, or something that it has to perform. And, whereas, and each process typically has its own inputs. Um, in parallel computing, typically there's one task that's shared by all processes, and um, all inputs are available to all processes, for example, in a shared memory. Okay, so in distributed computing, typically more processes make the tasks harder, okay, because there's more um, contention or a conflict between the different processes to, to achieve what they need to get done. Whereas in parallel computing, uh, more processes make the task easier because the work can be um, divided up amongst different processes. And if it's somehow um, having more processes is problematic, then some of the processes, uh, you program them so they just won't be uh, taking any steps, and that's fine. Okay? Um, and typically in parallel computation, we don't think about fault tolerance, where that is something that's uh, pretty fundamental to uh, distributed computing. Okay. Isn't another difference that <laughs> usually in parallel computing you're thinking of like a specific input output that you're trying to compute, whereas in distributed computing it's just like you're trying to reach some state? 
Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so, um, I mean, yeah, like matrix multiplication is something typically one would do in parallel computing and wouldn't be considered a, um, a distributed problem. But um, you may want to compute, um, let's say, the um, you, you may have the underlying network that you're given, and you may want to compute the diameter of the network. So you're still, there may be something, in that case, it's a particular task. But one of the differences there, in, um, in a parallel setting, you might have that graph uh, presented to everybody, or everybody has some in information about it. Um, so aspects of it are available to everybody, but um, in distributed computing, you don't sort of have your only lo your local uh, knowledge of that, um, and at the end, every process has to have um, the answer. Whereas in um, parallel computing, you might have all it's important is that, that say one process has the answer. So those are it's really the kinds of problems that we're looking at. But yeah, other questions. Yeah. Um, so um, here are some of the, the main problems that complexity theorists study about distributed com computation. So what problems can be solved in a given distributed model? Okay, and that really there is can be quite a bit of difference between synchronous models and asynchronous models. And if it can be solved, um, how efficiently can a particular problem be solved in that model? Um, understanding what makes a certain problem is hard to solve. And here we're often looking at fundamental problems that are used as building blocks in, in many uh, distributed uh, algorithms. Um, another thing is, because there's so many different models, we want to understand how the parameters of a model affect its computational power. Okay, I'm not expecting you to remember 15 different models. Um, so I'll, when I talk about the models, I'll, each time I'm going to give a lower bound, I'll, um, I'll tell you which, which particular model we're looking at. And more generally, what are the relationships between the computational power of different models? Okay. Now, most impossibility results in distributed computing rely on lack of knowledge about the system. So at any point in time, the state of a process, including the values of its inputs and local variables, describes the knowledge the process has about the system. Um, and to solve many distributed problems, processes need to learn information about the states of other processes. So unsolvability proofs show that this knowledge can't be obtained. And lower bound proofs show that this knowledge cannot be obtained within limited resources. Now, initially, processes lack knowledge of inputs of other processes and possibly some parameters of the system. Um, for example, they may not know the number of processes, they may not know the names of the processes, um, they may not know the structure of the network. Okay, so those are things that would be unknown. Um, An additional, um, their additional lack of knowledge can arise from asynchrony because you don't know how the adversarial scheduler has scheduled the other processes, and hence you know, don't know what, um, even if you knew what their state was at the beginning, you wouldn't know what it is later on. Um, and also, the, um, it can arise from faults. Now, for the rest of this hour, I'll present results about uh, message passing models, and after the break, I'll present some results about shared memory models. Okay, any questions? OK, so the first problem I want to uh, discuss is leader election. OK, so here um, what we want to have as output is that each, um, each pro um, exactly one process, who we'll call the leader, must output one, and all other processes must output zero. In this particular problem, there are no inputs. OK? At the end of the process, do everyone know who is the leader or just the leader? Not necessarily, no. No. So would you, this is, it's a, um, yes, it's a simplified, an easier problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you actually require everybody to know who the leader is, that computationally it's much more difficult mm -hmm. in a, a specific, um, yeah. Okay. So the model I want to look at is synchronous message passing. Um, and in each round, each process receives a message from each of its neighbors in the network and sends a message to each of its neighbors. And they can be arbitrary, um, arbitrarily different. Um, I'm not going to assume any faults. So we're not going to look at that. And, but I'm going to assume that the processes are anonymous. This means they don't have IDs. So they're all going to start in the same initial state and run the same program. Well, who are the neighbors? 
So we have some sort of a network, and that's whatever happened. So um, the first result that I want to talk about um, is uh, a very simple one, which says there's no deterministic algorithm for leader election, even if all processes know the network is a cycle of size n. Okay, so it's a very, very simple network, and this is a very simple, actually, result, but just a, sort of a warm up. Okay, um, so even in such a simple network, it's unsolvable, but more complicated ones it would be as well. Okay. So the difficulty is that there's no way to break initial symmetry. So initially, all of the processes look identical to one another because in terms of the, the network symmetric and their initial states are um, symmetric. So uh, to obtain a contradiction, let's suppose there is an algorithm for doing leader election. Okay? Um, then initially, all the processes are on their same, they're in the same state. And by induction, at the end of every round, every process must be in the same state as every other process. Thus, if one process outputs one, they all must output one, and that contradicts the correct, correctness. OK, so that was easy. Good. However, um, even it, so, um, so that was looking at deterministic algorithms. But what if there's randomized algorithms? Well, in fact, um, back in the previous situation, if we have a, uh, a um, a cycle like this, this, this setup, with randomization, it's easy. What we have is every process um, randomly chooses its value between 1 and n squared. Um, and then they basically send messages around trying to figure out which was the largest value that any process has chosen, and then check to see that that's unique. OK, so this is possible to do uh, with randomization. And in many cases, what we have, uh, for many problems, um, there are um, situations where deterministically the problem is unsolvable and with randomization it becomes solvable. Okay, and so we'll see a number of examples of that as we go along. Okay, so, um, but in this particular situation, um, there's no randomized algorithm for leader election um, if, the, if processes don't know the size of the cycle. Okay, so even if processes know that the network is a cycle but don't know its size, uh, they can't solve leader election. And in fact, um, OK. So in fact, all they have to, they don't even have, uh, there can be some bounds on that, even if they don't know the size of the, the, the cycle to within a factor of two. That's sufficient to uh, get this impossibility result. OK, so to obtain a contradiction, suppose there is such an algorithm. And because of symmetry, a process can't tell if it's in a cycle of size n or a cycle of size 2n. OK, um, thus, if there's an execution in a cycle of size n where some process, let's say this top one here, um, decides to output 1, then there's an execution in this, this larger cycle, OK, of size 2n, in which both this process and that process output 1, OK, because they're going to be in the same state. OK, and um, this. Uh, contradicts the correct op operation of the um, the algorithm. Yes. So what exactly is the definition of randomized? They need to be correct of priority one. But yeah, yeah, they need to. Be, yeah, yeah they, they, there's no. There they need to be correct always. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, typically, um, when I'm looking at randomized computation in distributed setting, I want uh, correctness, but I'm going to have some. Um, the randomization uh, can allow. Um, uh, infinite executions with a zero probability. Yes? So it's like a CP time kind of thing, zero error? Yes, okay. that's exactly right, yeah. So you mean two copies of S1? So, so here, so here um, what, what these are just this, these S's denote the state of the process. Okay, remember these are anonymous processes, okay, so they don't have IDs. So all we can talk about is their state. OK, now, what is the state? Well, they flip some coins, and now they, they still keep information in about the size of the network, but there's a, a problem in that they, can, they can't. So this, this process and this, this process can end up. This is the case in which they flip the same coins. So yeah, like, that's really right. It goes back to what we were talking Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes? So in this case, the algorithms should know when it's over. Or it's not like it eventually it will reach some steady state? Well, they have no. In this particular case, so there are models in which we have things about steady state kinds of things. In this particular problem, when I talked about leader election, um, 
Okay, um, we have the notion of output. So exactly one process must output one, and all other processes must output zero. So at some point, they do, do perform an output operation. Okay, uh, and that's what we mean by uh, the computation. But the time doesn't, shouldn't depend on the size of the graph? We're, we're not worried about this. Here we're just saying whether it's solvable or not. And so we, we're not even worrying about any resources because it's not solvable at all. So what's not acceptable is with positive probability two things are with one. That's right. I mean, there are variants of this, and, but we're not looking at that here. Okay. These were supposed to be just some easy things to get people warmed up. Okay. Um, all right. So um, the problem was that we were dealing with um, anonymous processes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so if we know that the like, length of the cycle is either n or 2n, can we solve it in this case or not? No. I think that this is the, the same proof went through. Okay. The yeah. previous algorithm did not work in this case? No, because, um, because what would ha um, you would flip coins in the range, you know, um, zero to I mean, choose a number so that you each process would choose a number in the range one to n squared, and then you'd um, you want to see if the, the problem is you let's say the highest number, okay, which is would be the number of the um, leader, you'd have to try and figure out whether that occurred once or occurred twice. Okay, and if it occurred twice, you can't tell, did it go around? If you know the size of the cycles n, you can go all the way around, count to n, and then say, okay, yeah, this, I've, I've just passed it around, and my, my value came back, and nobody else had that. But if you don't know if it's n or 2n, then you could have one or two different values. I think that question, to answer to Avishai's question, was probably different, though. He knows, you know the cycle size is exactly n or exactly 2n, right? I think this, you might be able to figure out that there are n plus one distinct elements, at least by randomization. So uh, anyway, but it's ZPT, right? So you don't want even a, a very small uh, probability. Yeah, there's no right? probability. Once you know that there are at least n plus one. Yeah. You know it, so you know it's exactly two n. How do you know it's at least n plus one? You're not going to be certain. random numbers to define. Yeah, but that's. But what happens if the cycle was of size n? And then you're ha then you're not going to that's never going to happen and so then you <laughs> this is one of the problems with distributed computing there not only do we have you know change a variety of inputs the, there's so many executions and we have to think about all of them so in the randomized case uh, you often assume that the number of steps is like there's no upper bound of the number of yeah steps. we're not that's important right. Well, I mean, it just it makes the model stronger. I'm stronger, and what I'm just saying is this is unsolvable even if you don't have a bound on the number of steps. Because we have like one finitely many steps, then you can reduce to the the case, you know, by just. But yeah, we're not we're not dealing with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what we want to do is look at the the leader election problem, where we're getting away from the problem of. Um, uh, anonymous processes, and we're going to assume that every process is a distinct ID. Okay, um, and so otherwise, uh, but the other difference we're going to have is we're going to say that we're going to allow process crashes. So we're going to allow up to F processes to, to crash. So what that means is the adversarial scheduler um, is allowed to schedule, th um, is allowed to stop scheduling up to F different processes. Okay, now we also have to be um, a, um, okay, um, we have to be a little bit careful in the model. Um, so, when if a, a process it, um, sends, a, if a non-faulty process sends a message um, to another non-faulty process, then eventually that message has to be delivered. Okay. So it's, the notion is, if we have two uh, non-faulty processes, we're assuming the link between them is also non-faulty. Okay. And so that what that is really is a constraint on the adversarial scheduler. Okay. So we have that set up in the in the model, and um, okay. And we we um, we also have a slightly different statement of the um, of the actual problem. Okay. So every non so instead of having every process must output zero or one, we have to say that every non faulty process uh, must output zero or one because if a process is faulty, it never gets steps. So how can it output anything? Okay. And we also have a, a, another requirement that no process can output zero until the eventual leader, the process that's going to eventually output one, takes its first step. Okay. Or um, and the reason for that is because. Um, 
if, a pro if you just have processes output zero and then the, pr the process and then all the other processes crash, you may end up having no leader at all. And um, anyhow, that, it's not a very interesting situation. What we're trying to model is a situation. Um, it's, leader election is basically used as a subroutine when you want to have some process to do something on behalf of the others. Yes, Ian. Uh, when uh, when can the adversary decide when to crash a process? Does it have to decide at the beginning before it's no. ready? No, it can, no. Um, it, I mean, yeah. I think it. Um, yeah, typically, just as it's going along during the, during the execution, it can do whatever it wants. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, here we have, a, again, another fairly simple result, which says that there's no algorithm for leader election in an asynchronous message passing system within processes if um, more than half of the pro uh, processes can crash. Okay, um, at least a ceiling event or two of the processes can crash. And um, the way we do this is we, we're basically going to use something called a partition argument. Okay. Um, so again, to obtain a contradiction, suppose there is such an algorithm. And what we're going to do is partition the network into two parts, each of size at most f. Okay? And since f is greater than or equal to ceiling event over 2, we can do that. Okay. All right. Um, now this is, let's see how the adversary is going to perform. Okay, so what it's going to do is that the adversarial scheduler is going to deliver all messages um, being between processes in the same half of the partition. Okay, but it's going to delay the messages that go from one part of the partition to the other part. So these things are going to be delayed. I mean, they're not, um, unless the process is on one end or the other crash, it can't delay them forever, but in any case, we'll have this. Okay. Now, let's look at the processes in the left part. Okay, so as far as they know, all of the processes in the right part may have crashed before taking any steps because the number of processes in here. Um, is it most f? So it's possible that that could happen. So eventually, okay, if they wait long enough, they one of them has to um, output a one, and so that the other ones can output zero. Okay. Similarly, in the right part, okay, these processes here, um, as far as they're concerned, all the processes in here may have crashed, and so there must be some process in here that'll eventually output one. Um, and so that the other ones could output zero. Okay. Now let's look at the situation after these two processes um, have output one. Okay, then the adversar adversarial scheduler is going to deliver all of these messages. Okay, and lo and behold, we have an incorrect solution. Okay. So this was allowing randomized. Even with randomization, it, yeah, that doesn't affect anything. OK. Um, so this, corrects, this execution contradicts the correctness of the algorithm. OK. Um, so those were all really easy ones. We're going to start to get into some that have a little bit more meat to them now. OK. So um, the next um, uh, lower, uh, lower bound I'm going, to I'm going to actually present a lower bound. And this is going to use a technique called indistinguishability. Okay, and this is in fact, indistinguishability in fact is used as part of almost every lower bound technique. But I'm going to just give you some of the background definitions here. Okay, so we see that two configurations C and C are indistinguishable to a set of processes P. And we denote that with C, this twiddle P, C prime. If each process in P has the same state in C in, in, in both configurations. And we see that two executions starting from those configurations uh, are indistinguishable to the set of processes, uh, which we denote in a very similar way. If the, the starting configurations of those executions are um, indistinguishable to the processes in P, and each process in P performs the same <coughs> steps in execution alpha as it does in alpha prime, and those steps are performed in the same order, and um, so we, each process has the steps performed in the same order, but though you know they, they may be interleaved differently. And moreover, each process gets the same responses from those steps. So for example, if it's a shared memory model, they'll, they'll be, and they're doing reads, they'll get the same um, values back. If they're getting messages, uh, if in a message passing model, they'll have the same messages at the same time, and then they'll have the same contents. 
Okay, so that's um, so th th that's what we mean by indis uh, indistinguishable executions. As far as they're concerned, everything looks the same. So is this in the synchronous setting? Or? Synchronous, asynchronous, whatever. Okay, this is just a general. There was this notion of some messages may have been sent but not yet received. Yeah. So when, when there things are sent but not yet received, what we have to worry about is. Um, whether the executions are accessing, in those different configurations, there may be um, different uh, messages in transit. And so if, the, um, algorithm, if during that execution those messages are accessed, then we, they would, the executions would not, be dis would not be indistinguishable. Good. Okay. Now suppose that alpha is a finite execution starting from some configuration C. We use C alpha to denote the configuration at the end of alpha. Okay, just and I'll be using that notation not so much here, but a lot later on. Um, and there's a very simple <coughs> proposition. So suppose that alpha and alpha prime are finite executions um, starting from configuration C and C prime, and they're indistinguishable to a set <coughs> of processes, then the resulting configurations are uh, indistinguishable to that set of processes. So you okay. want an alpha prime on the last? Pardon? You want an alpha prime on that very last bit? Oh yeah, there should have been an alpha prime. Sorry. And, do we, and we need C and C prime are indistinguishable. Yes. So, but, that, but if we go back to, uh, okay. okay, that's part of alpha and alpha prime being indistinguishable. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so now I would like to give an actual, <coughs> a fairly interesting lower bound. Finally, um, so here we have. Um, so now we have. Um, we're looking at the same um, asynchronous message passing system um, that we were looking at before. But now, remember, um, the previous results said that if. Um, uh, ceiling of n over two processes can crash, then the problem is unsolvable. Okay, so now we're going to say, okay, well, we're only going to allow uh, ceiling of n over two minus one processes to crash. Okay, so we, we're not in that situation. Um, then the claim is that any algorithm in an asynchronous message passing system with n processes has omega and squared worst case expected message complexity. So even if we're dealing with a randomized algorithm, um, essentially we have to have lots and lots of messages in order to do leader election. So that's n squared message per process. No, total. This is a this is um, a total total number of <coughs> messages that are sent. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so to obtain a contradiction, suppose there's such an algorithm, and the idea is that the adversary, the adversarial scheduler, is going to pick a set of a floor of n over four processes, and it's going to put each one in a bubble. Okay. So um, the, the scheduler is going to allocate steps um, in a round robin order to the processes. And messages sent to or from a process in a bubble are going to be trapped in this bubble. Okay? Uh, so basically, a message that's sent, it's, it's never going to be delivered. And anything that um, you, you send to it is not going to be delivered as well. It's just going to be sort of hanging there. Um, OK. But all other messages are going to be delivered immediately as soon as they're sent. OK. and. Um, the, the uh, adversarial scheduler is going to release a process from its bubble when its buffer contains at least n over 4 messages. Okay, so once, it's, it, um, there's a, once it can contribute to our, to our overall sum um, in a meaningful way, we'll let it uh, continue. Okay. Um, now, to each process not in a bubble, this execution is indistinguishable to an execution in which all processes that remain in bubbles have crashed. Okay, so I mean, it, there are only n over four of them. It's getting no communication from them. So as far as it's the, a process that's not in bubble is concerned, um, you know, those ones have crashed and everything else is going on. Okay, now let's look at a process in a bubble. So it's indistinguishable to an execution in which the following processes have crashed. The other processes in bubbles, it's not. Um, the processes which have sent a message to PI and the processes to which PI has sent a message. Okay, so thus a, a PI must eventually leave its bubble or will return while it's still in a bubble. Okay. Um, Yeah, so the, the point is that there are at most um, n over 4 processes in bubbles, and altogether there, there's at most, um, there's um, less than n over 4 processes in the, the other two categories as well. Okay, now um, the claim is that no process PI can return while it's still in a bubble. 
Okay. Why? Well, because all the steps might be before, might be before the steps of um, all the other processes, in which case PI would have to perform, I would have to output one, return one. Um, other, but it might also be the case that all of the steps are after um, one or more other processes have returned, okay, in which case PI must return zero. Okay, so someone else might have already been chosen as the leader. Um, thus, every process in a bubble must eventually leave its bubble. Okay. Um, now, there are N over 4 processes initially in bubbles, and the process is released from its bubble when the buffer, its buffer contains at least N over 4 messages. Thus, we look at the product of those things. Uh, omega of N squared messages are sent in this execution. Okay. Questions? Was the n over four crucial? Sorry. So the n over four, we had n over four. Um, so we, um, so what we like the the importance. Let's see. Um, okay, so what we had where it was crucial is we we had to uh, it had to be so n over four had to be small enough so that a process um, who's in a bubble and not seeing anything else happening. Um, the system looks like it's uh, um, it's still a pro it's still an appropriate execution. Okay, if if um, if I just if I am sending messages and waiting to receive messages and things like that um, from a process from other processes and they're they're only uh, and um, they're fewer than n over four that I've communicated with um, and the other ones that are in bubbles. Then, as far as I'm concerned, this is a correct e execution. Okay. The, this is all fine. It's just all the other ones that happen to be good processes I'm not communicating with. Okay, and so I still have to do something because this is a valid execution. And so that's where it comes in. Yes? So that log on actually is a bit stronger than that, right? It, also, it says like a linear number of players must send a linear. It also rules out like even one player sending. Yeah, no, no. Okay, yeah. Um, that's correct. Yeah, I just was stating it in a simple form, but yes, you're right. Okay. Other questions? All right. Um, all right. Now, what I'd like to do. Um, so, so you think in that last lower bound, so uh, the n over 2 minus 1 is the best we can do, or even with. Well, so the previous result said with um, n over 2, it's impossible. Right. But suppose n over f the number of failures is only n over 4. Or, or can you get in it? Yeah. You um, don't know, or are there upper bounds? I, I, it, it depends on the number of failures that have occurred, and I think there is some sort of a trade-off, which I don't remember offhand. But uh, since this isn't my result, I'm, I don't feel obligated to remember all the details of that. <laughs> OK. Um, OK. So indistinguishability can be used in other ways. And I've, I, it can also be used to get a lower bound of the number of rounds to compute the diameter of the network. OK, so the, the, let's look at this problem. So every process knows the size n of the network and the IDs of its neighbors, and each process has its um, distinct ID. And the, the, in this particular problem, every process must output the diameter d of the network. OK, so that's our goal. And again, we're looking at synchronous message passing systems. Um, in each, you know, here, we're going to look at synchronous message passing systems. And in each round, each process can send, its, send a message of unlimited size to each of its neighbors. And we're not going to assume any faults. OK, so this is a um, we'll look at a simple thing. OK, um, so the, base, the following result is folklore and pretty obvious. Um, the computing the diameter requires omega of d rounds. Essentially, um, the, if we look at the process over in the left, um, in, um, so in this case, in the first three rounds, it can't uh, distinct, uh, I mean, it will have trouble be distinguishing between this this graph and this graph in fewer than d minus two rounds. Okay, so but that's not a very interesting thing. Okay. Um, now the upper bound can be achieved by flooding the network um, so that every network, so that every node um, learns the entire graph, and that would take order d rounds, or d rounds exactly, uh, or d minus one rounds. Yeah, I guess d rounds exactly. Okay. So um, now let's turn. So that wasn't very interesting. And the problem was because with flooding, we're just sending the whole graph. And, uh, you know, you're, you have the local information, and then you just send the, what you know about the graph, and everybody learns everything. So there's nothing interesting computationally there. Um, 
But let's suppose that the size of each message is more reasonable. So let's suppose that each process can send a message of b bits to each of its neighbors in each round, where b, typically b is going to be order of log n. Okay, so something small. Um, and this is a, actually a very well-studied model. It's called the congest model, so it actually has a name to it. Um, yeah, synchronous message passing each process is a di distinct idea, and there are no faults. Okay, so we're looking at that, and we're going to look at the computing the diameter problem. <coughs> okay, so the follow we get the following theorem, which again is a fairly recent, not that old. Um, any algorithm for determining the diameter of a graph with n nodes using b bit messages requires omega of n over b b rounds. And in fact, this is true even if all nodes know in advance that the diameter is either two or three. Okay, so I mean, certainly the lower bound of d still, uh, omega of d still holds, but even for graphs of very low diameter, um, we get um, we get a, a good lower bound n over b. Okay, good. Okay, so the the approach is to use a reduction from communication a com communication complexity problem, and um, so. And this is basically um, what Anoop was referring to, um, I guess, uh, yesterday, when he, yesterday um, morning when he was talking about um, using communication complexity for distributed computing problems. So I'm going to give one such example because he didn't get to one. All right. So in this particular case, we're going to look at um, a reduction from the set disjointness problem. So this is one of the standard uh, hard problems. So I, just as a review, Alice ha and Bob each have inputs, k bits of input. And they want to determine, uh, and these k bits are, deter are basically denoting the characteristic vectors of um, a k element set. Uh, or, um, or a subset of uh, k elements. And they want, to, they want to know if their two sets are disjoint, namely, if for every index i, either xi is equal to 0 or yi is equal to 0. So that's what they want to do. Okay? And as Anoop mentioned, this problem is hard from a communication complexity point of view. Um, we need omega of k bits of communication to solve this problem by any randomized protocol. Okay, so the idea here is to reduce the set disjointness problem to the problem of determining whether the diameter of a certain graph has, um, is either two or three. Okay, so um, let's consider the following n node graph. It consists of two nodes here, these black ones, and n over two divided by, and four cliques each of size n over, n minus two over four. So the, the remaining ones are divided up like that. Okay, and um, these, the blue, red, green, and, and purple are uh, sets of nodes or cliques, okay? And um, so what we have is the two black nodes are connected to one another. The left black node is connected to all nodes in the blue and the green cliques. The black node on the right is connected to all of the red nodes and all the purple nodes. And moreover, the, if we look at the ith node in the blue clique, it's connected to the ith node in the red clique for, for i equals 1 to n, over, n minus 2 over 4, and similarly for between green and purple. Okay, so that's our, um, that's our, our graph we're going to start with. And what's the diameter of this graph? Okay, well, I claim it's 3. Okay, so let's see why. Well, black nodes, um, so the, let's say this left, left black node is connected here, and 1, distance 1 to any of those, and distance 2 to any of these. Okay, and similarly for the other black node. Um, so now let's look at, let's say, some node uh, in the blue clique. Okay, so it can, um, it can reach any node in the uh, red clique in, in two hops. Okay, um, by just going to the appropriate, the appropriate um, corresponding one and then going across. Um, and similarly, can it can also reach any node in the green clique in two hops, okay, by going through the black node. Okay, the problem is between blue and purple, um, there, uh, we have three hops, okay. Um, we can either go this way or this way, but we have three hops, so the distance is three. Okay, everybody happy? Good. All right, now suppose that we add an extra... Um, edge between here and here. Okay, what does that do for us? Okay, um, now there's a path between this node here 
and the purple node that corresponds to that green node. Okay? And moreover, there is a path from uh, this green node to the, the red node that corresponds here. Okay? So these are paths of length two. So now instead of having this path of length three, in these specific cases, we have paths of length two. Okay. So similarly, if we have um, this edge over here, okay, we have this path of length two between those and um, the path of length two between those. Okay. So what we're going to do is associate a different variable xi with each of the uh, possible edges between the blue and green nodes. And there is, since there's n minus 2 over 4 nodes in the, in the blue clique and n minus 2 over 4 nodes in the green clique, altogether there are um, this k, this, the square of that um, possible edges. Okay, so here's one, okay, between let's say the third node here and the first node here. Okay, um, and we'll say that the graph, the edge is going to be in the graph. Um, if and only if uh, the vari uh, Alice's <coughs> input variable xi is equal to zero. Okay, so the, we're, this is how we're given an instance of a set disjointness. We're going to construct this graph in which we have a, an edge for each uh, variable that Alice has which is zero. Um, and we're going to associate the variable yi with the possible edges between the corresponding red and purple nodes. Okay, so. Um, so if this is the third one here, going to the first here, third and first, third and first, okay, we have this yi, and the edge is going to be in the graph if and only if yi is equal to zero. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's going to be a path of length um, two between this node here and that node here, okay, if xi is equal to zero, or yi is equal to zero, okay? And otherwise, there will not be, okay? So the resulting graph is going to have diameter two if and only if for every value of k, for every possible pair of blue and green nodes and, and corresponding pair of, of red and, and purple nodes, um, either uh, xi is equal to zero or y is i is equal to zero. And otherwise, the graph is going to have diameter two. Sorry, it had diameter three. Okay, now, okay, suppose that there's an R round algorithm for determining whether the diameter of any graph in this, in this class, okay, class, has diameter two or three. Okay, now the algorithm is going to communicate at most n times r times b bits across um, this cut. Okay, why? Because in each round, each, um, okay, so how many edges are there here? There are n over two edges, and we can send things either way. Okay, so altogether, um, there are, there would be n messages going across. Each message has b bits, and altogether there are rounds. So we look at the algorithm. Total number of bits communicated is n times r times b. Okay, and um, now what we have is, um, Okay, we have our situation here. Here we have the set disjointness problem, and we want to solve that. So Alice has input x1 to xk. Bob has input y1 to yk. Um, now Alice has enough information to from her, her inputs um, to construct this half of the graph. Okay, and Bob has enough information from his inputs to construct this half of the graph. And now what Alice and Bob are going to do is simulate the algorithm. Okay, so we're, each round they're going to look at what kinds of things, any local communication can be done locally by Alice or locally by Bob and don't, doesn't have to be com communicated. But anything that has to go across this cut actually has to be communicated. So, um, but how many bits are, are have to be communicated? Um, okay, they simulate this, they communicate at most n times r times b bits. Okay, um, so what does that tell us? Well, we know that the complexity of solving, and, and from that they can tell whether the gra graph has diameter two or three, and hence whether the, um, the original inputs are disjoint or not, okay? And um, so what this tells us is because we know we need at least omega of k bits, um, even in randomized, for randomized algorithms to um, solve set disjointness, we know that n times r times b has to be an omega of k, okay, which is omega of n squared, and the diameter of the algorithm 
um, the di thus our diameter algorithm must take um, R rounds, which is omega of n over b. Questions? Good. Okay. Now, um, okay. So what we've just shown is that um, we've we need omega of n over b rounds to compute exactly compute the diameter of a d node uh, a diameter d of an n node graph with b bit messages, um, and so this is approximation factor one, um, and. Um, using depth breadth first search, okay, you can simulate you can do depth through breadth first search on, on the uh, network, and you can easily get um, you can easily compute the diameter to within a factor of two using breadth first search, okay, and that only and that would take um, can be done in order order d rounds, okay, um, so. The approximate, if we're doing approximation factors, that, I mean, this n over b now is no longer relevant. Um, in 2012, there was a lower bound that showed that if we're going to get a 3 half minus epsilon approximation, then we need uh, d plus n over, uh, n over b uh, divided by poly log n uh, rounds. And uh, only a couple of years ago, there was an algorithm which showed that um, the three half is approximation. Well, we can do it with d plus uh, square root of n. Okay, so there's this. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm missing something because the example that you showed shows that it's hard to tell between two and three. So doesn't it show that it's hard to approximate to 1.5 also? Um, I mean, you allow an additive. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So approximation factors are just the multiplicative. Do you allow free additive contact? Just, yeah. Gap, uh, like 20 and 30. Ah, okay, so you want to see the yeah. numbers. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this, this is just, um, uh, anyhow, it's looking at some of this. But, so even though, the, um, I, I guess I should mention that um, this particular result, the n over b, is, there's actually an algorithm that matches that for exact um, when b is order log n. I mean, for, um, it, it works for b order log n. I mean, any smaller number of things, but it's it's unknown whether it's tight when b is is much bigger. Um, but also that there's some big gaps here in terms of open problems, in terms of a trade-off between approximation factor and um, the the actual number of rounds that we need. So I just wanted to state some interesting um, some interesting open problems. Um, there were actually. Um, Karen Sensor Hillel gave a really nice talk at Podsi, an invited talk at Podsi um, uh, last month, and um, where she uh, surveyed this and a variety of other um, problems, including minimum vertex cover, um, de detecting whether a graph contains triangles or four cycles, um, and lo looking at uh, there's a variety of those. So that's available on the Podsi website if you're interested um, talking about some of the other open problems in this area. Um, and um, yeah, OK. So other questions? OK, I think I'm going to stop here. And then we will continue with um, shared memory, lower bounds, two different techniques um, after the break. Thank you.